everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cosmic Conversations. I'm your host, Marla Martinson, and today I am with the fabulous Frankie Picasso. Hey, Frankie. Hello, all in the universe. <laughs> Yay! Well, you guys, if you don't know Frankie, she is an international socialpreneur, talk show host, and champion for change who's been transforming lives and influencing culture for the past 30 years. Professionally, she's a certified life, business, and master coach, trainer, author, artist, activist, and philanthropist. She just happens to specialize in the impossible. Frankie was the first professional female kickboxing promoter in the world and managed 12 ISKA welterweight champions. I this is she's a twelve-time champion. Oh my gosh! And uh, she's also the founder of the Good Radio Network and the host of Mission Unstoppable Radio. Frankie since and more. My gosh, Frankie, you, it feels like when I went to your website, it feels like I'm looking at my own. I do. You wear so many hats. So do I. You know, I know. I'm a Gemini, so I've got like two people. Got to. Are you? I was. I was thinking, is she a Gemini? When I was looking at that. <laughs> Absolutely. They're the I only ones that can do that. June 11th, right in smack in the middle of, of there. Nine. Oh, wow. Okay. So I totally We're Real that. close. I was feeling that when I was looking because you're so talented and what a beautiful artist. Oh, thank you. But I really felt like, you know, we were really simpatico. Like we had so many things the same. I'm like, oh my God. Like it's like, you know. Sisters. Yes. <laughs> and so what, what is it? That, we're going to talk about your new book, mm -hmm. but what is it that you're most, you do all these things, but what would you say the thing that you you most do, you know, for work or your passion? Yeah, um, <laughs> good, good question. I mean, the radio has been my passion for the last 12 years. It really has. And um, I don't know where I'm at right now, and I'll be really honest with everybody, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I, maybe the cards. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe the cards? Yeah, I read the cards too, and, and – um, a very special coach of mine, you know, last week, she, a mentor, she said, you know, why don't you design your own cards? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. But like I might. We'll see. Deck. Yeah, like an Oracle deck. Um, I like to read, like, she's got these beautiful nature spirit cards that I like to read her cards. But um, she says it's time for you to do your own. So okay, we'll Frankie, this is too crazy because guess what I started doing? You designing cards. your cards. Reading cards. Oh, reading cards, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I was doing angel readings, kind of channeling them for people, and I'm a distance healer, and then a year and a half, a psychic told me that I meant to do writing, which I do, I've written five books, yeah. healing, and he says, you're meant to, you should be giving readings, and I'm like, what? I said, I don't know the cards, and so it kept in the back of my mind, and for a year and a half, I've been studying the tarot, and then I've got my oracles, and I've been reading cards, so it's it's. Wow. What I love when we get to be a certain age, you know, we've been in business for a while and stuff. It's like throw some things in there that we're passionate about to have some fun, right? Absolutely. I got my site went up. It was called card readings for you. Dot co. <laughs> it's up. All right. Well, I'll put the link to that. That's exciting. Thanks. I'm going to check Thank that you. out. Okay. Thank you. Love yeah. It. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens, but I do enjoy reading. I mean, I get a little bit afraid sometimes when I do it um, just because you just want to do it so well. Yes, yeah. I, I hear you on that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but other than that, I do, I, I love it, and I was told I've done it forever, and we'll see. We've done it in past lives. Yeah, know. many, many times. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. So tell us, tell everybody about this book. For, for one for to 40 pounds, yeah. and it's not your weight. It's actually yeah. the British pound. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a picture of my dad on the front, and he was probably about, 15 or 16 there but when he was 13 um he, he he was born in vienna austria and that was on march 18th was his birthday was his 13th birthday he just turned 13 and at the same time hitler um had come in and it was the anschluss so it was the um taking over of of austria from germany and so now the nazis are invading and he's from a Jewish family, and his father had been arrested and taken to into um, a camp, and they had, their home had been confiscated, and they had to move into, I guess you would call it like a ghetto area. All all of like their store had been taken, and all sorts of income had dried up for them. And my dad um, said to his mom, he had an older brother, two years older. He said, "I'm I'm going to go to England and save everybody." 
So he took off from home, uh, no money, no map, nothing, no clothes, and walked 1500, about 1,500 kilometers to Amsterdam, where he, when he arrived, he said, you know, I need to get on a boat, and he saw a sailor, and he had heard him talking, and he, actually, he, he was speaking German, so he goes, can you help me? I need to get on this boat. I need to go to England. He goes, well, do you have any money? He says, no. And he says, well, come back tonight at midnight. So at midnight, he came back, and the, uh, the sailor got him onto the boat, and, and he stowed away. And in the morning, they, they sailed the channel over to England. And when they got to England, um, authorities said, well, you know, he didn't speak a word of English. And you, they, first of all, they put him into a camp like they do now today. And then they said um, all of the men had been, you know, were, were getting uh, – taken up to go to war in England and so they needed help on the farms for food and so they said you can go to a farm or you can go to jail kind of thing and he says no I'll go to the farm yeah. and so that's where he was on, on the picture of that book he was on the farm in England and um, Reverend Staunton he owned that village it was called Staunton on the Vale and he owned that and um so we're for one to 40 pounds came in, my dad got a letter from his mother and, and Hitler said that you have like a very, very short window of opportunity where you can buy your way out of, out of the country and buy them out of the, out of the confinement. So he needed 40 pounds to get his father out of, um, uh, you know, out of confinement and to get him, his mother passage on a boat uh, in Italy in Genoa, they left from Genoa, uh, the Saturnia, to go to uh, the U.S. She had um, family, I think, in the U.S. who said, you know, you can come here and stay if you can, if you can leave kind of thing. And so he showed the, the letter to Reverend Staunton, and, he, and the Reverend says, well, let me think about it. And he came back. He said, well, I'm going to send your mother the money, but how are you going to pay for this? And he goes, well, I'm going to work. And so that was five years of work for 40 pounds, which is 90, 90 bucks. Today. Right. Unbelievable. Well, he at least he could eat up there. <laughs> yeah, he could eat there. And and the reverend's wife took, you know, some interest in him and, and started to give him English lessons and comportment lessons, like this is how you eat properly and, you know, your knife and fork, like he's never going to go to these fancy places. But she did all of that for him. And yeah. it did it did do him well in life. So bless right. her. And then, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, it was fascinating when I was reading the book and reading about how he walked and had to hide at night, and, you know, or in the day and find his way, all that. You know, when I interviewed him for the book, and um, that was the most embarrassing thing that he had to tell me, really, was that he stole clothes off clotheslines in the middle of the night. He stole food. And he goes, like, he didn't want to tell me this. And he, I go, oh. what, what do you expect? Like, oh my gosh, compared to what the Nazis were doing. I mean, <laughs> I mean yeah, yeah, yeah it, you know, like, the, but he said, had such a ethics and such a, such pride, you know, yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. So, but um, yeah, that was interesting, but that was his, you know, his guilty. Oh, that is so sweet. And so then he does make it uh, to the, the States and everybody. So uh, give us a little, now, um, then he's in Southern California later, and he has uh, some wives and family. And tell us a little bit about, about yeah. That. Well, when my, my dad was he was actually engaged to marry a girl um, back in England, but he went. He his mother had um, I don't know if, if you saw Private Ryan. There was a law that came out that if you have just one son left fighting, that you could bring him home. Yeah. And so she went and she because I had a little pin. I found this pin um, actually a couple of weeks ago, and it was the pin that you get from the president or something if you know anyway you're a mother of of you know these these children who went to war um so they brought him back on a u-boat uh, to new york because that was her last surviving son her her older son had had passed away he was shot down in the in the war so my dad comes home and um sees his parents he hasn't seen him for like over 10 years and they've arranged for him to be married they've arranged all of this kind of stuff for him and he's like oh, i haven't seen him i should be a good son what should i do and and i guess he went with you know i'll marry this girl so he married he married harriet and they had two children uh, my brothers paul and andy and um her mother the, the the grandmother which the boys call the dragon lady um she ran everything she was a matriarch of the family and she told everybody you know when to jump when to sit when to eat and my dad you know 
hey, since he was 12 years old, pretty much, he'd been on his own and uh, making his own way in the world. And he, he just couldn't handle that. So he said to his wife, you know what? We got to go. We're going to we're just going to leave the family business. I promise you things are going to work out. I'll get another job. And well, she was kind of afraid to do that. And her mother said, if you leave, you know, if you stay, I'll give you $10,000. But if you leave, you know, I cut you off, nothing ever again. So she, that kind of scared her. So she took her boys to Florida and they lived in New York City. And she told her best friend or her friend, I don't know if they were best friends, but she told her friend, look after my husband while I'm gone, which was my mother. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> would be yeah. my mother so of course my mom had two little boys exactly the same age and she started to make dinners and my mother's father my mother's husband had committed suicide and so you know i don't know how the time span but i guess she'd been grieving and now they're both alone so you know things they're adults things you know happen and um they took off her rio de janeiro <laughs> <laughs> and then i'm the bun in the oven oh so they ended up my dad, things weren't happening. They thought Rio was a really good spot because there was lots of tourists and stuff, but um, it just wasn't happening in his industry. So he left and he went back to Austria, uh, to Salzburg this time, which is where I was born. And um, he made a go of it there for, for a little while. But then there were, uh, another war was about to break out. And her father, my mother's father wrote and said, um, it's too close to you, Russia and whatever. You got to get out of there. We really want you to come home. And so they insisted. So home meant that this time they went to Canada. They immigrated to Canada. And that's where I am. And that's where I grew up pretty yeah. much. And uh, <laughs> that, that, there, here we are. So my dad had a few contacts in the elevator business. And one had reached out and, you know, he started, he, he, he had, brought him into the sales end of things um and as it ended up my father ended up becoming the president and then he ended up buying the company and and made his way you know uh did 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 well in the world we'll say yeah in the elevators that was interesting yeah yeah and um because it was a really booming time in toronto and in other places where high rises were starting to go up and you know so it became a good industry um for him and and, and he did well. And when he sold the company, he sold it to a Swiss company. And they said, you know, we would like you to um, do acquisitions and things for us in the United States. And so he says, okay, well, I want to retire in San Diego because I love the weather. It's temperate. So that's where he lived for like 30 some odd years until he just, he moved about five years ago to Mexico. Oh yeah. In Mexico. He, he uh, what part of Mexico? He loves Mexico. Um, he, he's in Punta Piedra, which is just about, mm, like 45 minutes, 50 minutes outside of uh, uh, San Diego. Yeah, yeah, from the border. Like, yeah, past Rosarito, but in Baja. How beautiful. Do you go down there and visit? Yes, I do. Yeah. 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 Yes. I love it. I absolutely love it. Like, I'm like him. I love the people. I just love everything about it. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the color, the art, everything. Isn't it? It's, it's great. My husband's from Mexico City, so we go off to that way that, but that's nice. down, down there. But it is, and then just branching out to little towns and cities it's it's so charming it's incredible what they're doing now with the with all the wineries and and the restaurants and the pop-ups in these fields is i'm just like oh it's incredible I've too. I've had so it. so he's down there now and then he has this wonderful wife now right tell us a little bit about her because she's very dynamic yeah she's she is um we're the same age <laughs> 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 and my dad's 94 and uh, her name is Irma, and she's beautiful. She's Mexican, um, but lived in the U.S. for most of her life, um, and and worked. And but she's absolutely, you know, she is. She's gorgeous, and but just so sweet and just so nice, and just loves his brain, loves his mind. And they had met when he was working um, af after he retired, and and he had bought into some real estate land land deals. Um, there was a, one that it just fell through and, and they lost, he lost all his money. And uh, so he had to start a second business at 70 ish. Yeah. He started over it. This is great to, for people who feel that, Oh, it's too late. I can't do anything. He lost everything and started over in his seven. He lost everything and started over again. And so he looked for a little business that he could buy and he found a t-shirt business and he didn't know anything about the t-shirt business. Um, but I guess the price was kind of right and the deal was right. And so he bought it and he thought, yeah, you know, pretty much you can do anything. If you're an entrepreneur, you kind of feel like you can pretty much do anything. Right. Yeah. So he, he got it started. And, and of course the machines were old and he didn't know anything like he didn't know, but anyway, 
she comes along and she sells them these brand new ones and tells them what to do and and taking out customers to to mexico and and um and, and things like that so they got along very well and his wife at the time they, they got along everybody got along well and liked each other um but his wife his, his wife at that time dorothy she died of pancreatic cancer and after um after about 30 some odd years of marriage and um my dad's a survivor you know he never looks back he only looks forward and so people were really mad at him that he got into another relationship but he said like my wife was dying for three years we grieved for those three years he took her around the world he did everything you know that he could um but it was over like he knew in his head it, it's gone it's over i've grieved and life goes on so by accident he ran into Irma in the bank and she had just broken her wrist or something and she wasn't working and so they spent a bit of time together and she helped him clear out the house and things got whatever they got together yeah. so um you know i've seen we're saying wasn't do i reminding of dancing or they into dancing or she was or something well, my dad's a wonderful dancer. Everybody wants to dance with my dad. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I have some siblings who were really upset about it, um, step siblings, and, and um, I get it. But at the same time, you know what? Like, how long do you wait when you're in your 80s? You know? Yes, and my gosh, why not be happy? Why not have that support? And it's beautiful. Like, you can't bring the person back. So, you know, you're not. Eric goes, well, you know, I, I, for me, it's just really live and let live and, and move on. And if you can be happy for any moment, be happy, honestly. Like, we don't need to be sad. Yes, mm -hmm. and I'm sure his wife uh, in the other day. Yeah, she chose her. Yeah, so she said, I know who you'll be happy with. Yes, happy, yeah. Because he, he, she knew. She knew he liked, you know, pretty girls and, and um, you know, who thought he'd have a chance. But you never know, right? Yes, that's right. And then we've got Peter Jennings on the on the. Yeah, Peter's a wonderful wonderful man he's a wonderful author and I asked Peter um, if he wanted to co-write co co the book with me and the reason I asked him that was twofold one I didn't want to interview my siblings I wanted an objective voice to do part of that book um, and then I would kind of be the color commentary <laughs> the inside insiders voice and I didn't want people thinking I was stealing the show my, my siblings like I was stealing the show my dad my dad you know he People had been telling him, gee, Bert, you should really write a book. Like, oh, my God, what a fascinating story. But he never told the whole story. And I never knew the whole story. Nobody did, really. And, and when he turned 93, I think he just turned 92 or 93, he said, okay, you can write the book. And, and so we went down. Peter and I went to Mexico for a couple, three days, four days. And we stayed with my dad. And um, no, actually, it was longer. And we stayed with him. And we just kept tell me a story, tell me a story. And, and if I knew something, I would. You know, hey, what about this? What about that? And he, he will remember, and and the stories would just keep coming out. And of course, once we get home, I go, Dad, what about you know, what about? Um, but he did a great job at remembering, and and so Peter and I just, you know, you go do your thing, I'll do mine from my notes, and um, we'll take it from there. So I think it worked out. I think it kind of worked out. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think it'd be a great movie or a little mini series. Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? I th I thought so too. Um, and he's got, you know, my dad's got like all these kids, and <laughs> and he's, you know, adopted, and 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 it's just really great. And I thought it was really timely now because of immigration and and how people feel about immigrants. And you know, he's he's the immigrant that really could be anybody that that. Um, came in and made it better for for lots of people you know i think at the height he probably employed 500 people and you know like who knows yeah that's that's it that's it's just amazing from that scrappy little kid that walked all those miles to survive and he, what yeah he doing and being an entrepreneur and starting over and everything it's just such a testimony and now what's he doing is he just relaxing now or is he yeah i was just talking to him yesterday <laughs> <laughs> he you know he would love to be working like that, his mind is always on the next deal. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they bought they bought a house, they fixed it up, they sold it. They're buying another house, fix it up, and sell it. And that's, they're kind of doing that little bit uh, of stuff. And of course, you know, health wise, he goes, "Yeah, my highlight today is going to the doctor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little bored. We gotta go to the doctor. We gotta go to San Diego see the doctor." Uh -huh. But um, he's always, always trying to like. He CNN is on first thing in the morning. He reads every journal, every you know Time magazine. He reads everything that he possibly can. He's still very interested in everything, yeah. and um, age hasn't. It only slowed him down physically. It didn't slow him down mentally. Right. That's yeah. Right. 
Yeah. So um, he said, gosh, if I only met her, you know, 20 years ago, or if I only did this, you know, um, I get it. But yeah, that's it. cherish every moment. Yeah. And then you have some other books too. I do. Yeah. I have um, Midlife Mojo was my first book and that was a book um, I wrote about midlife and, and, and what it's like to, it's really a prescription for change, but what it's like to change in midlife and why it's so special. Um, and I really felt that people were so um, engaged in their, in, in, bad relationships and, and lives that they weren't happy with because they were afraid to make a change. And so I thought, well, let me show you how to change your life. <laughs> this is how you do it. Because I'm kind of like my dad. I'm, start over. Just start over. You know, yeah, if you don't like it, yeah. start yeah, over. It's scared. People won't leave relationships because if they're over 50 or a job. They're too scared. It's, we do come from a lot of fear. Yeah, we do. And so uh, Midlife Mojo was, was about um, ex like getting them to understand why they don't change and, and, and then how to, how to change and how to change your mindset and um, be unstoppable pretty much. And then I've got this, this big one. I don't know if you can see it back here. Whoops. Uh oh, I buried my chest. I buried my chest was last year's book. You can see it's a huge book, oh, 700 and wow. some odd pages. Yeah. Yeah. And this, um, this book was, um, I buried my chest, 21 unstoppable women get naked and they got naked about their lives and they were, brutally honest and so i mean i was just so proud of everybody because they were um just so courageous in telling their stories and we i asked everybody i, I co-wrote it with alex akorshi from uh, nigeria and the women in this book were from five continents they were jewish muslim christian whatever buddhist they they were lesbian transgender heterosexual fluid they were everything right. and it's absolutely amazing because i had no idea when we picked like just no idea when we reached out to women and said hey would you like to be part of this this book mm -hmm. um but they they had all attained some form of you know um success for themselves and we asked them all the same question and it was really like tell me about um love friendship um money mm -hmm. uh work and and but don't just weave it into a story we want a narrative and it became a, a wonderful book and you could just go through and look at everybody what everybody thinks about money but in love and friendship or sex but you could also just enjoy each story on its own and, and say oh that's interesting if, where they live in the world whether they live in india or they lived in you know africa or or um, south america doesn't matter um we are the same and we are different but we are very much the same Yes, women I think wherever we go, we just want to be happy, take care of our families. Get yeah, yeah, love. absolutely. Yes, and it, it's fascinating. I think that no matter what age you are, you have an opportunity to learn from other other women um, and their situations. And and I, my hope was that people would identify and say, oh, "Yeah, that's just like you know, I'm going through that right now. What did she do to to solve that?" Mm -hmm. And and get a nugget and go, oh, "Yeah, maybe I can do that." Like I remember, um, and it was really important. I don't know why it was so important for me to do this, but when I was really, when I was in my early twenties, and um, or I was just starting to have kids and whatever, and um, my credit cards got maxed. Like I just didn't know what to do with credit cards, right? Oh, I want this. I'll just eh, plastic, yeah. and I got in trouble. Yeah. And I said to my dad, and I never asked my dad for money, um, but I said, "What's your what's your suggestion to me?" He goes, "Well, you can call up the credit card companies and say I'll give you." 50 cents on the dollar i'll give you 10 cents on the dollar and we'll clear this debt and i didn't know you could do that oh i didn't know <laughs> so i did that wow. and i negotiated a really good deal and so we went from like you know five thousand dollars down to seven hundred dollars i'm like okay we can do that wow. so um i put that in the book i said you know what if you're young and you're struggling with this or older and you know you've got a shopping problem um this is what you can do to get out of it and maybe it's a you know it'll help somebody so those are the kinds of things that we learn by you know through our life experiences that we don't always know about right you can do that with hospitals too i have a friend who's you know the, the things they charge is just outrageous and he's like that's ridiculous so i'll pay you this but and you can negotiate so you know my dad had had surgery um earlier this year he had a spinal um stimulator inserted and i think he told me the other day that it was like 
$950,000 surgery or something crazy like that. And I'm like, how does anybody in the United States, like if you don't have insurance, how do they, you know, keep their home or keep their families or anything? Like health is so important. And yet, you know, it's outrageously astronomically expensive to get health care where you live. Yeah, I don't have it right now because it went up so high. It went up higher than our mortgage. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so we said, and we don't even use it. And we couldn't use it because the uh, deductible is so high. So we're like, right now, uh, that's it. And I go do holistic stuff. So maybe sometimes we can get health insurance again. But for now, we're going to pay the mortgage instead. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I know, it's crazy. And yeah. you know what? If he didn't have like major problems like right. heart problems or whatever they for all the other stuff they go to in mexico they go to the yeah. doctors there and he says they're wonderful doctors i went to a clinic with him while i was there it was like 40 dollars, yeah. and you got the same care that you get everywhere else in the world um and and it was really good so well, maybe in mexico at the pharmacies they have a doctor there and we yeah went, we went to the pharmacy and we went to the doctor got like a vitamin b shot and did things for yeah it was 15 bucks or whatever it was great yeah. yes yeah take advantage if you can absolutely That's yeah cool. well frankie thank you so much for stopping by cosmic Conversation. Uh, thank you it's been an absolute pleasure and uh you guys check out uh the uh her links her new card reading uh thank you sites and her books and coaching she's got a lot of stuff going on and let us know in the comments what did you have to start over? Is there something that you're going to do in midlife? Is there something you want to start doing? Let us know because we want to hear about it. And uh, much love, everybody. Until next time.